however, in Ottawa today. B.C.'s premier is in town to meet with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The premier came to town with a focus on housing, clean energy and bail reform. He's with me here live in studio. Hi, Premier Eby. Good to see you. Thank you very much for making the time today. Hi, Vashi. Glad to be here. I have a number of questions about the items on the agenda with the Prime Minister, but I actually want to start off asking about an issue that's dominated until today, really, uh, headlines here in Ottawa, and that is the announcement the Prime Minister made in the House of Commons exactly a week ago that an individual, a Canadian Sikh leader killed in your province, murdered in your province in June, he says he has credible intelligence that links the government of India to that murder. Had you had any advance warning that that statement was going to be made? Uh, the Prime Minister called me that morning in advance of the announcement to give me a heads up uh, that he would be rising in the House about an hour later to share that with Canadians. Uh, obviously, it's quite a shocking announcement for British Columbians and especially in the Sikh community in, uh, in British Columbia, a uh, really big deal. And with knock-on effects for other communities in our province, you know, Iranian expats, uh, people who have moved to British Columbia from China, for example, who are nervous about uh, government involvement in British Columbia and uh, politics and community, uh, foreign government involvement. Uh, it was a big deal. Do you have any questions about the credibility of the intelligence, or did the Prime Minister provide any of, any of that intelligence to you? Well, you know, I, as, a, as an elected leader myself, I'm sure that the Prime Minister wouldn't have stood up and made such a disturbing announcement without credible information shared with him. The concern that I have is that uh, there's a critical need for provinces to be brought into the loop at an earlier stage. Uh, CSIS, for example, uh, by law, is required to only share their intelligence with the federal government. Um, it means when they brief me, which they did that day, uh, they can share basically what's in the public domain already, which is not helpful. I can read the newspaper too. Yeah. Um, so the ability to share that information is so critical. and it. It was an issue that came up when I was Attorney General around transnational crime and money laundering. Uh, it's an issue that is certainly present on this issue. It's ar there around allegations of Chinese interference in uh, elections in British Columbia and other parts of the country. Um, and we really need that information to be effective in our measures provincially. Have you had any, ha has there been any receptiveness, I should say, from the federal government when you raised that issue? Uh, it's, it's been a journey, but I think we're in a place now uh, where the federal government is, uh, is more able to share that information. There's been processes I've had to go through uh, to get clearance, but also um, there's discussion now about changing the uh, federal CSIS Act to allow that organization to share information more proactively, and I, I'm very hopeful that that comes to fruition because uh, that'll be transformative, for example, for a chief electoral officer to be able to have real-time information about threats so that he can change our Elections Act uh, to respond to it to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. In layman's terms, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering, I'm guessing people at home wondering are wondering as well, is when the Prime Minister, for example, called you or when CSIS briefs you on this information, is there anything you learned that is more than what we have all learned in the, in the public domain at this point? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, it's uh, it's no. called uh, public domain or open source information, uh, and so it's what's available publicly. So members of the BC Sikh community have very specifically expressed kind of worry about their own safety in, in, in light of that, but also at the time of uh, Mr. Najjar's murder. Do you feel like your capacity to help in that endeavor is at all held back because of your limited access to that information? Well, I, I do think there are steps we can take provincially to support uh, the protection of expat communities from a number of different places around the world uh, where people end up in British Columbia as their new home. Uh, we want people to be able to express themselves on issues that they care about, including issues that may be taking place in their homeland without interference. We want people to be able to participate in elections without interference. Uh, and so there are steps we can take, but we can only take that if we have the information. So that's been my consistent message with the federal government, and I, I think that message is, um, is finding... Uh, some fertile ground now and they're they're taking the steps so that we can do what we can as a provincial government to support people in our province. And just quickly before I move on to the other subjects you're here for, ha have any of the investigative services, the police, the RCMP that are, are tasked with investigating and ultimately prosecuting what happened to Mr. Najjar, have any of them conveyed to you any concerns about their investigation unfolding or any of the kind of public scrutiny that has ensued over the last week impacting that in any way? No. And, uh, and I think it's critically important that the RCMP investigation be able to take place without any interference or involvement of political officials. So I don't begrudge that at all. I think that's necessary. But for the intelligence side, I think that information helps us as a provincial government on policy. Okay. On the housing front, because that has dominated kind of 
uh, federal politics now for a while, surprisingly, because so much of it is under provincial jurisdiction. I know you get a lot of, obviously, this is a huge issue, particularly in BC, particularly in Vancouver. The federal decision last week and the legislation it introduced to remove GSD from purpose-built rentals, do you anticipate that will have uh, a big effect in British Columbia? And if so, can you quantify or qualify what you think the effect will be? Yes, so this, this announcement is really important. When the rental building is complete and it shifts over from being under construction to being occupied, uh, that transition was deemed a sale by the federal government and that GST would apply. Uh, so when you're talking about a building that costs $10 million, $20 million, these big rent, purpose-built rental buildings, that number adds up in a hurry and you have to have rents uh, that much higher in order to be able to cover costs with the rising interest rates, uh, we had a lot of re rental housing developers in the private sector say they were putting projects on hold. This announcement has caused uh, many of them to say that projects that were previously on hold are now going ahead under construction. This is very good news. And uh, we're asking the federal government to consider uh, for nonprofit housing developers that started construction before the announcement that they would be able to benefit from this as well. The new policy is only for new construction going forward. Uh, but we have probably in the neighborhood of 500 units of nonprofit housing that could also benefit. And then we could offer even lower rents for low income people in the province. So, so that to me t ties a little bit of. Um, a string just because it is not for profit and one of the criticisms of this legislation was that there weren't enough strings tied to it and essentially how do you know for sure that um, the kinds of rentals that are going to be offered are more affordably priced and I think that's especially relevant in Vancouver for example where the average rent is higher than anywhere else in the country I think rentals.ca in August said it was over three thousand dollars which is like a draw dropping number uh, do you think the legislation as it's designed will be maximally effective or would you have liked to see more strings attached to it? No, uh, so in British Columbia we added 250,000 people to the province in the last two years alone. Uh, population is growing way faster than our number of housing units uh, for people to live in and as a result of that uh, we're seeing dramatically increasing rents uh, because as people are priced out of the housing market because of rising interest rates or they don't have a down payment, people, more and more people are competing for a very limited number of rentals. So uh, anything that gets more rental housing built um, is, uh, is going to be helpful in, uh, in addressing that huge gap between the number of people we have and the number of places to live. People go on Craigslist, they're looking for a place uh, and uh, there's one place that's in their price range in the location they want to be and there's a lineup of 20 people to rent it. And so we need more and more rental housing coming on and the, these broad policy changes that don't require a bunch of forms to be filled out or auditors to come in from Ottawa or whatever to review it, that it just works, are really badly needed. I know the demand side of things is certainly part of the problem and it is in a number of provinces like yours that has seen a huge influx. But what responsibility does your own government bear for the supply side issues? And for let's just talk about rents, for example. I think in 2017 and 2020, your government had promised a rebate for renters that you only just implemented in the last in the last budget, and it was sort of you know semi-watered down. It's only people who have an income under eighty thousand dollars who who can qualify. Why didn't you act faster on something like that to try and abate the situation that your province finds itself? in right now? Well, we're the only province in Canada that recognizes that renters uh, aren't treated the same as people who are in the housing market. There are lots of uh, benefits that come when people buy. The, it's the capital gains exemption for your principal residence. It's the property tax benefit that you get in British Columbia. A certain amount of your initial property tax is covered with a grant. Uh, renters need fair treatment too, and so that's why we brought that in. Uh, but you can't live in a rental rebate. The key for us is to bring on the housing. So we've set records of housing supply uh, for two years in a row now uh, in terms of new market housing, rental and for purchase. The uh, challenge we have is it's not keeping up and also uh, the housing that comes on is for a very specific group of people. You've either got a down payment to buy and you have a significant amount of money uh, or you're able to hit that, uh, that rental level. So what we're looking at doing is use things like using public land where we can build housing on publicly owned land uh, or indigenous why weren't you government looking, land. With respect to part of the interpretation, why weren't you looking at that earlier? You, you didn't answer why it took so many years to fulfill the promise you, you promised you originally made in 2017 on the rebate. And on the supply side, all the records that, that you're touting, there's a lot of scrutiny that's gone uh, into the numbers that you've presented and that it's not all brand new builds, right? Mm. It's certain policy changes that have allowed 
stuff that already exists to be classified as a new housing unit on the market. Right. Again, do you feel like you should bear more responsibility for the problems that your province finds itself in right now on the supply side of it? Oh, I think it's critical for provinces to stand up and 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 uh, and to take the measures that are necessary. But you know, I want you to keep in mind, uh, in the 16 years of the previous government before we were sworn in, there were fewer than 100 units of student housing that were built in the whole province. We but have, you've been I there was for seven a, years. I was at a school uh, yesterday where there was one building that had more units than were built in 16 years. We've got a huge gap. We inherited a huge gap. We've been building uh, and opening empty units. We had speculators that were uh, uh, sitting on empty homes. Uh, tens of thousands of homes brought back on the market through speculation and vacancy tax. Uh, we're taking action on short-term rentals. And all of these challenges are exacerbated by massive population growth in the province. So we know we've got more work to do. But you have been there for six years. Pardon Absolutely. me, six years to 2017, yes, right? This isn't something that happened overnight. No, and, and it's been a focus of our government since swearing in. But housing doesn't happen overnight. And also all of the process, including our own provincial processes as well as city processes to get these units built. In my own community, government-funded housing in the city of Vancouver, uh, we funded this, uh, this building for people struggling with poverty, mental health, and addiction. Uh, it's been two years now, and it still hasn't broken ground because of municipal processes, and the neighbors have now filed a lawsuit against it to stop it from going ahead. So, you know, we have to deal with these structural pieces as well to get these things built. It is a wicked problem, and, uh, and we can learn from other provinces and the federal government and local governments and provincial can work together, but the bottom line is it has to be all hands on deck to address this. Okay, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time. Premier, I appreciate your time as Thanks always. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. David Eby is BC's Premier.